Hi, I'm Caroline Levitt. I'm the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze, the book initiative that was begin, begun shortly after the pandemic to help authors, independent bookstores, and readers. And we have somebody really, really special here today. I'm really, really excited. We have Patty Davis. And we have her book, Floating in the Deep End, How Caregivers Can See Beyond Alzheimer's. And it's actually an amazingly hopeful book. And it also says a lot, not just about Alzheimer's, we're going to talk about this, but it's a lot about family relationships, sibling relationships, and having hope in a world that sometimes might seem hopeless. So Patty Davis, of course, is the daughter of Ronald and Nancy Reagan. She's also a tremendous author. She's the author of The Wrong Side of the Night, Wrong Side of Night, The Earth Breaks in Colors, The Lives Our Mothers Leave Us, and The Long Goodbye. And of course, this gorgeous book, this cover. Whoops, sorry, floating in the deep end. <laughs> so welcome, Patty. I'm so I'm so thrilled to have you here. It's thank you. It's so great to talk to you. It's great to talk to you too. So I let's get right into it because this book is just it's great. It's absolutely great. So the first question I wanted to ask was. How is this book? You, you've written about Alzheimer's before in, and your father in the book, The Long Goodbye, which mm -hmm. talks about saying goodbye in stages, which is what Alzheimer's often makes us do. What I wanted to know is, how is this particular book, Floating in the Deep End, an outgrowth of The Long Goodbye? How are they different? So The Long Goodbye was a book that I started um, early on when my father, almost right on the heels of him being diagnosed. And I structured it as um, as a journal, um, not a daily journal, because it would have been five thousand pages long. But um, uh, you know, everything is dated, and and, and so I, I was writing about the experience as I was going through it, and writing about what I was learning as I was going through it. But what you learn as you're going through something changes once right. you have gone through it, or it, or it, I don't know if it changes necessarily, but it it is enhanced and it settles in with you and you, and you realize um, the other dimensions of, of um, your, the experience that you had. And it took me a lot of years, you know, after my father died, I was doing lectures um, while he was ill occasionally um, on, on exactly that, what I was learning, et cetera. And after he died, I remember saying to my lecture agent, I, I don't want to go out and talk about this anymore. I think I said something like, I, I, I'm finished with Alzheimer's, which now that I think back on it was such a naive thing to say. <laughs> because you're never finished with it. No. Once it's come into your life and it's changed you, um, you're, you're never finished with it. Right. Right. That's true. So your father announced his Alzheimer's in 1994 and you assumed caregiving activities what do you can you like tell us about like how did you even know what to do at first because it seemed like so much of what you discovered was discovered while you were doing the caretaking right i had no idea what to do none of us had any idea what to do and and i want to say something also about <clears throat> about caregiving because i've had people say to me um, especially when I was running my support group. Well, I don't know if I'm really a caregiver because we've hired outside people to do, you know, feeding, dressing, bathing, things like that. So I don't know if I can really call myself a caregiver. No outside person can give the care that you can give. Right. You're the person who has an emotional history with right. that individual, no matter what that history is. Maybe it's troubled, maybe it's loving, Maybe it's a mix of the two. No one can, no outside person can can give them what you can give them. So to the degree that you show up, you are a caregiver. Um, so I was living in New York at the time, 1994, and um, I would fly back and forth um, pretty frequently until I ran out of money and couldn't do that anymore. So I moved back to California and then I spent more time with my father and, you know, could go on walks with him and sit with him. But I, I had no idea what to do. I, and that's, and, and I think that's 
that was the wealth that I got from this experience is saying to myself, I don't know what to do. I am going to follow my instincts here. I'm going to just do what feels right. Um, there, it wasn't like I could call somebody else and ask them because right. nobody was talking about the disease in 1994. Lots of people had it, but nobody was talking about it. So I was kind of on my own. In retrospect, I think it was a good thing because it, it enabled me to figure out a lot of the things that I ended up using to form my support group program beyond Alzheimer's. But it was really just kind of hit and miss. And, and I would say the same thing about my mother, um, that she just would try things. You know, my father was going to the office for um, several years uh, after he was diagnosed in limited periods of time. No one told her or advised her that that, that kind of structure to his days would be helpful, but it was. And now I think it's sort of common knowledge that that to the extent that someone is able to still function in their regular life, go into an office, um, you know, hopefully you tell other people in the office what's going on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so they're not baffled. Um, <clears throat> but it's helpful to that to that person because we respond to structure in our lives right. and we respond to familiarity. So there's still that if there's still that framework there, it helps that, that person. I, I, I'd really love to hear more about your support group that you founded beyond Alzheimer's, which is both at the really famous Cleveland Clinic and it's also at the, I'm going to mispronounce this, Geisinger. Geisinger Medical yeah. Center in Pennsylvania. That's amazing. That's To me, that's angel's work. Can you tell me how that came about and how you yeah. think you have this support center and some of the things it does and how people can find out information about it? Well, at the moment, um, I, I don't actually know if, I don't know if Geisinger is still running the group, and I think COVID probably okay. derailed some things. I know that Cleveland Clinic, uh, well, they both licensed the group in in 2017. Let me, okay. I'll backtrack a little bit more and then get to that. Um, 2011, I, at three o'clock in the morning, had the idea of starting a support group because for years people had come up to me, you know, they would recognize me in the store or whatever. And would tell me very intimate things about what they were going through with a loved one who had Alzheimer's or some other kind of dementia. And it just finally occurred to me that a support group would be a really good idea. So I had this idea at three in the morning and then at like five in the morning, I was Googling Alzheimer's support groups and I didn't find much. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to start one. And it was never there was never any doubt in my mind that I wanted it to run at a hospital because I, I felt like the medical community hadn't given enough attention to caregivers. And I still don't think they give enough attention to caregivers, by the way. Um, and um, I wanted it structured so that I would be one facilitator, but that I would also have someone from the medical field. So there'd be two facilitators because that person could answer questions that I couldn't answer, um, right. medical questions. So um, <clears throat> I went to UCLA and David Feinberg, who I've dedicated this book to, was running uh, Reagan Medical Center at, at UCLA. And I met with him and he was on board like immediately. So I ran the group there for five years. Then David left and went to Geisinger and there was a new administration there, which was not as enthusiastic about my group. So I moved it to <laughs> Why St. Why not? Todd. Why not? Why weren't they as enthusiastic? <laughs> because, because the medical establishment, as I said, is doesn't care enough for caregivers. I mean, they know, doctors know that statistically, caregivers of people with dementia are very likely to end up in the hospital as patients from stress-related illnesses and even die before the person they're caring for. I mean, the person with dementia doesn't have any stress. Every moment's new. The person, the caregiver right. is, said right? That in the book. Right, that's right. Every moment is new. It's the caregiver. Right, they're not right. stressed out. They can get upset and they can have a tantrum and 10 minutes later, they don't remember it. 10 days later, the caregiver is still thinking about it. 
So they're the ones with the stress and they're the ones who end up getting strokes and heart attacks and other stress related right. conditions. Right? right. So, um, so yeah, there was definitely a shift in attitude there. So I moved it to St. John's hospital and I ran it there for a year. Um, for a combination of reasons, a lot of it having to do with time. I had two unfinished novels uh, there that I, I wasn't getting time enough to, to work on because running a support group was not just the two nights a week that I was there. There's also outside work and research mm -hmm. and homework. And, and we were running off of donations at that point. Um, there are costs to running a group. No one is charged for coming, but there are costs to running. So all of that was taking up my time. And I thought, you know what, I have to, I, I, I've been doing this for six years, twice a week. I, I need to step away from this now, but I will try to license it to hospitals. So in, that was 2017. Both Geisinger and Cleveland Clinic licensed it. Um, and uh, there were other hospitals that I approached and I got pretty much the same answer from all of them. This is a great idea. It's a great program. Uh, but it's just not in our budget uh, to run something like this, which I heard as we don't care enough to do this because yeah. the, the model that I wrote up was um, for a group meeting once a week. I thought that would be more palatable to them, but it was the same structure as two facilitators. So you have to pay them and there's, you know, liability insurance and website costs and stuff. So for a hospital, it's a little more than like 30,000 a year, which is, Nothing, nothing for a hospital, nothing. you know, it's like pocket change. So I think, again, they just, you know, they don't, they don't care enough. And that's ultimately how I came to write this book. Cause I thought, okay, well then, you know what, I'm going to put all everything from this support group in a book so people can carry it around with them and refer to it. One of the things that I find really fascinating about you, Patty, is when, I mean, oh, we're friends and I, we've had lunch and we talk and I love you. Um, when I first met you, I didn't know what to expect because you're a president's daughter. <laughs> but I found out that the most interesting thing about you is you sort of defy expectations. I mean, here you are, you grew up not really being mothered. You've written about how your mom, Nancy Reagan, was very cold. And in fact, during the Alzheimer's, you were sort of mothering her. Yeah. But just that sentence, you were mothering somebody who did not really mother you. You're one of the most open hearted people I know. And in this book, you talk, you write a lot about forgiveness. So first, I want to know, where did that come from? It seems like growing up in the family you grew up with, you had insurmount, almost insurmountable odds to become who you are. And yet, you know, this open, loving, big hearted woman. How did you make that leap and how did that and then the second part of the question is how did that help you in terms of dealing with your father's alzheimer's and having to deal with your mother again and caring for him well it wasn't a leap first of all it was a lot of hard work <clears throat> and i don't i don't think i was really open-hearted and in, in my in my earlier years um, okay uh well i don't remember a lot of my some of my earlier years because i did a lot of drugs in those years <laughs> which is kind of selfish it. in and of itself. So <laughs> maybe I was open hearted when I was on drugs, but I don't remember that. <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think I was very, um, I was very locked in to my own woundedness, you know, that uh, parents that, you know, had them had each other, but didn't really, you know, extend themselves that much to their, right. to their children. Right. And, right. and so I was very, I think it was very enamored of my own pain in, in many ways, you know, and, That's and as I got older, I, I think that keeps you locked into your adolescence, you know, because that's, there's no maturity really in, in that, in being, in being enamored of your own pain. <clears throat> and I wasn't, happy with that. I tried a lot of things over the years to get out of this sort of prison that I felt myself in. Um, I mean, I learned to meditate in the 70s and, and um, you know, I read all the things that we all read, you know, The Road Less Traveled and all of that. Um, right, right. 
Um, when I, uh, and that when I was married, my, my husband was into self-realization fellowship. So I, you know, I really studied that. And so, I mean, it was, it was always an effort to, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it was always an effort to change. It was always an effort to say, to say, you know what, this is not who God put me on this earth to be this sort of kind of constricted, unhappy person. But I think, I don't think, I know that the real sort of breakthrough um, was when my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Because as I write in, in this book, I was at a really, really low point then. Really? I had, um, I, I sold my house at the bottom of the market in Los Angeles, I was divorced. I sold my house because I'd gotten subsequently into an abusive relationship, and I did what I am prone to do: run away. That's always sort of my. That's always been my default position. You know, I'll just run. So I ran okay. to the other end of the country, and I lost everything. I mean, I sold my house at the bottom of the market. I lost everything, and it, I was in one of those periods where, and I didn't really know anybody in New York. Um, I was in one of those periods where just everything I touched turned bad. I was just, I was, um, I was in such despair and I really was thinking that I don't want to be on this earth anymore. I, I didn't feel that there was a reason to be. Okay. And um, when I got the call that my father had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and which was something that my brother had told me they saw signs of years earlier, but I was not supposed to when he fell off the horse they did a brain scan and they saw uh, you know, plaque in his brain. But my mother told my brother and he told me, but I wasn't supposed to know and my father didn't know. And anyway, okay. so it wasn't, it wasn't, the diagnosis wasn't a real thing until 1994. And um, when that happened, I, it, it was really kind of this epiphany. I thought, you know what? My problems are really small compared to this. And also I want to be here for this. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to show up for this. Mm -hmm. This is how he is going to leave this world. And I thought his letter was so, his letter to the world was so eloquent and so gracious. And it was just, it was something that was bigger than me, do you know? And it took me out of that. It didn't mean that, oh, now everything's great and I'm not in pain anymore. Mm -hmm. But it, but it broke those, those walls. And it, um, I, I said to myself, you know what? I remember distinctly walking the streets of Manhattan, kind of talking to myself and saying, you know what? You have gotten so many things wrong in your life. You're going to get this right. That was that, sort of the, the commitment that I made to myself. That's extraordinary. You also talked a whole lot in this book about forgiveness that when mm -hmm. something like this happened, it's sort of, you can't, you can't keep focused on the past of what right. happened and who did what to whom. And, and you were watching your mother suffer and you had to sort of forgive her. And also there was forgiveness involved in your father and in yourself as well. Can you talk about that and how people can best forgive those who, have, who they feel you know, have wronged them or haven't been who they wanted them to be yeah you know one of the um one of the real breakthrough things from for me was when i started studying the course in miracles which has as its basic tenet that forgiveness is the answer to everything and i think it explains really well that it's not forgiving what that person did because people can do horrible things to right. other people that the, the the essence of forgiveness is that you are remembering about them what they have forgotten about themselves. That's so profound. That's right? really true. Well, yes. I didn't make that yeah. up. Of course, miracles did. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I can't take it anymore. But that's that's where forgive because forgiveness for me was always kind of confusing before that because I thought, well, but they did this and this and this, right? But then when it was when I when I learned that, I went, oh, that's right because. God didn't create that meanness in them. God didn't didn't lead them to do that. They did that. So there's a soul in there that is still this pure, loving soul. It's just gotten all buried between all beneath all this other stuff that they've 
chosen to do and chosen to be. So if I remember about them what they have forgotten about themselves, that's the essence of my of my forgiveness. And really, you know, you forgive for yourself. Right. Not for others. Not exactly for them, right. because they might never care. I mean, exactly. my mother never knew that I forgave her. And, and if she did, she would have said, well, what are you forgiving me for? I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have, well, it wouldn't have computed also, anyway, right? You can't really change anybody, but you can change. You change yourself. yourself. You change how you, you look at that person. Right. You also said that, you know, that giving yourself a, a chance to work through your father's disorder helped you to almost know your father better. Yeah. Uh, it sort of like opened up. You talked a lot about, I mean, you talk a lot about faith, which I also want to talk about. Um, because you have you have a strong and unique to you faith, which really served you well. And I'd love it. I mean, there, there's one incident in here in this book, which is really moving, where I think your mother was talking to, was it Jerry Falwell? And she said she was seeing your father, Ronald Reagan, after his death. And Jerry Falwell. No, it wasn't said, Falwell. It was Billy Graham. Billy Graham, Billy Graham. I'm sorry. Oh, please, Billy God, Graham. I hope she never talked to Jerry I Falwell. <laughs> and he said, he said, I'm very sorry, but that's not possible because it's not, there's nothing in the scriptures to say that that's possible. And you wrote about it. Well, so what? <laughs> it's sort of. No, what, what really I said to her happen. was she was, she, she had been, after my father died, she saw him sometimes at night. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, I said, well, were you dreaming? And she said, no, I saw him. So I would ask her like, well, how old was he when he appeared to you? And what was he wearing and stuff? You know, my mother was not very detail oriented. So I, I didn't get a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of information about that. But it was like, well, regular clothes. I don't know what that means. But um, but I really, I was really interested in this. And, and I, I said to her, you know, don't tell a lot of people about this because other people might not, you know, or might not believe this and might think that you're being silly or something, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, I believe that you really saw him, but just, just don't tell a lot of people this. Of course, she ended up telling Bob Colicella for a Vanity Fair piece. And if she hadn't, by the way, I never would have written about it. I would have kept her confidence. But she told the whole world in Vanity Fair, so I wrote about it. But and it helped oof. her. I what? think the thing is it helped her and it, it made her feel more more connected to him. Um, I, I yeah, but wait a minute, but I want to finish the Billy Graham thing. Okay. So, so before she told the world through Vanity Fair, she said, she told me that she told Billy Graham on the phone about it. And I first thought, well, okay, well, that's probably okay. But she looked so sad. And I said, well, what did he say? And, he, and she said, well, he said, Nancy, I'm sure that's comforting to you to think that but there's really nothing in the scripture about that. And I went, I'm sorry, what? That's terrible. I think there's a rather famous story in the scripture. Jesus died on the cross and three days later, he was back on the road and people saw him. And she went, oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean there's nothing in the scripture about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I also wanted to ask you, do you yourself worry about getting dementia and are there things that all of us out here who are worried about getting dementia um is, are there things we can do to help prevent that or stave it off or just know what our options are should we be planning for it um i do not worry about it because i resolved to not worry about it i think it's very very toxic and very dangerous to go around um worried about getting dementia, then every time you forget something, right? you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get, I believe in that Deepak Chopra idea that the cells in your body listen to the cells in your brain. So if you're going around thinking, uh oh, I'm going to get dementia. Well, you know, you might, I told a story in this book about the man on the beach who I used to see when I moved back here and I'd be walking on the beach and his, he was a well-known film person. And, um, he knew who I was and I knew who he was. And he would tell me about his mother who'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and ask me about my father. And then every time he would say, well, you know, she has it, so I'm going to get it. 
and I, and every time I would say, you know, that's just not true. I mean, don't think like that. He didn't want to hear that. And finally, I just stopped saying it because he didn't want to hear it. Well, years later, he ended up getting Alzheimer's. I mean, I can't prove that he got it because he decided he was going to get it, but he did decide he was going to get it and then he got it. So um, I just, no, I don't. And in terms of preventative measures, you know, basically, and I didn't make this up, this is sort of information that's out there. Everything that's good for your heart is good for your brain. So a good diet and exercise mm -hmm. is good for your brain and also reducing stress. I also want to, you also mentioned another book, which um, I got kind of an electric thrill when I saw you mention it because I love this book. It's called You Are the Placebo. That's the correct Yes. Title, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it's this great book about how scientifically there are case after case after case where it says if you start obsessing about something and worrying about something, what happens is it your body yes. responds to it, your heart constricts, your veins constrict, your blood pressure rises, and you can get those diseases. Yes. Um, and I think that I wanted to throw that book out too as a companion piece to yours that can help anybody struggling with this because it's it's an incredible, incredible book. And I I, I also wanted to mention um, Deborah Copagan wrote this book called uh, Lady Parts. And she talks about how she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer which is usually which is terrible terrible cancer and she decided her last six months she was just gonna have a lot of sex and she had a lot of sex and when she went back to the doctor the cancer was gone and she said right. how is this possible and they said well you know what there's been studies done where when you have orgasm you produce a certain chemical and that chemical has been shown to shrink tumors. So yeah. there's definitely that kind of correlation. And there's a lot of it that you talk about this stuff in this wonderful book, Floating in the Deep End. Well, you have you know, I know, I just want to mention doctors know and have known for a long time that we can become psychosomatically ill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our brain tells us something and then we get ill. And it's not that we're not really ill. I mean, physically we're ill, but it's yeah. a psychosomatic illness because our brain caused it. Well, if that, if our brains are powerful enough to make us ill, our brains are powerful enough to make us healthy or keep us healthy. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. You have a lot of questions um, and a lot of comments. Um, okay. Chris Lyman, a wonderful author, says, it's always an effort to change. Yes. Sally Beth Edelstein, another wonderful author and artist, says, the point of the toll caretaking for loved ones with Alzheimer's is a sadly true one that I witnessed with my own mother-in-law, who single-handedly cared for her husband with serious Alzheimer's. A year after he died, so did she. At 69 of a stroke, the stress has taken its toll. And yeah, that's that's exactly what we were talking about. Um, Margin wants to know, what has been emotionally the hardest thing for you about writing this book? <sighs> I guess revisiting some things, you know? I guess revisiting the memories that, um, you know, brought up so much grief in me at, at the time and sort of revisiting that grief. Um, I think that was probably, I mean, I, I brought myself to tears sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's in, hard in certain, certain passages, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't think, you know, that the grief doesn't, doesn't leave you. It's still, it's still part of you. Um, Do you feel like you learned something new just in the writing of the book? Um, I do, it, because um, for one thing, I had to really organize this book in, in some kind of sequential way. And I write fiction more than I write nonfiction. I mean, I do journalistic pieces and I have written, obviously, nonfiction books, but mostly I write fiction. And I don't outline things. I don't have any idea where I'm going when I'm writing a story. So there's no, there's no, you know, organizational component to that. So this was, I had to, the, my publishers wanted, editors wanted me to outline mm -hmm. what I was going to do. And, um, you know, the outline shifted a little bit, but I mean, I had to really, 
I had to organize things. I had to um, I had to do it in a sequential way. And even though, you know, I mean, there are loosely stages to dementia. There's beginning, middle, and end. But but they're not. There's no clear definition of each stage. So I had to to try to Im- impose um, a sort of arch or a sequence of of the disease um, into the book, so that so that people could find what they needed easily, you know? It's like, well, my loved one's kind of in the middle stages. Well, let me, you know, let me refer back to that part of the book, right? Right, I think you did that. I, In fact, the book has all these great tips, like um, have the doctor tell the patient that they have Alzheimer's, not you. Yep. When I saw that, I thought, of course, like, why would you want to take that away from the, from the, that's a really important consideration because you don't want to remove them from being a part of the diagnosis. Um, you also say when you take something away, give something back in return. Yeah. And also this, this third one is actually something that I think everybody can use in life. When, um, change the perspective. When somebody with dementia is really nasty to you, you have to stop and realize that it's not really directed to you. It's that they don't have the tools anymore to stop being like that. So if you have sympathy towards them instead of condemnation, it can make things a little easier. They're not trying to hurt you. They're, they just don't have the tools to understand more fully. Well, they also don't have the filters. Yeah, I mean, all of all of the people's filters, all of one's filters go away with dementia. So, I mean, we've all had times when we would like to bark at somebody else, but we don't because it wouldn't be appropriate, and we stop ourselves from doing it. Well, the person with dementia can't stop themselves from doing it, so they're just going to say whatever right. comes to them. Right. Um, you also said don't assume that they don't that people with dementia and Alzheimer's don't hear or understand. Give the patient dignity. Yes. So it's sort of like you don't talk to them like a baby. Yep. But what do you do if, I mean, my mother had severe dementia toward the end of her life. And a lot of times she would like talk and ask about things that were not there, or she would believe that she was 16 again. And I always would just have an argument with my sister because I felt, well, let her talk about it and we'll yes. respond inappropriately. And my sister felt, no, you need to say you're not 16. Do you know? No. Nope. But I always felt that made her more agitated. So it did. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a whole a whole section in this book about lying. I called it creative lying. Right. Um, you know, most right. of us were right. raised to always tell the truth. Um, well, that's a good lesson in life. But Alzheimer's is a completely different world. And in the world of Alzheimer's, lying is your friend. You need to lie and you need to lie creatively. If someone thinks they're 16, go with it. Who right. cares? You know, yeah, who can, it doesn't and, matter. If we it doesn't like, matter, but all but it does matter if you're gonna contradict them because then all they're getting is that you're contradicting them. To them, it's real. You know, there are people on the roof. Do not tell them that there are no people on the roof. To them, it's real. There were, do you know what? There were, I saw them and I chased them away and they're gone now. If they're waiting for a phone call from someone who died six years ago, um, you know what? They can't call right now. They're on a, um, they went on a cruise and they're way out in the middle of the Indian ocean and there's no cell service there. So, um, They'll, they'll call soon, but they can't call right now. Did you feel that you made peace with your, I mean, I know the answer to this from your book, but I sort of want you to talk about it. Did you feel that you made peace with your relationship with your father at his death and also with your mother because of your relationship with your father, just by being present and being there and going through this? Because it's obviously a different relationship you have with somebody who has dementia um, than somebody who does not. Because I felt like I did with my mom, who was a totally different person at the end. Yeah. I definitely feel like I, I came to a peaceful place um, with my father. Um, <clears throat> you know, his his essence was a very sweet and, and gentle person. And that is what happens with dementia, is someone is stripped down to to their essence. 
So if they were always a, a nasty, bitchy person, hang on, because it's going to be a really bumpy ride, because that's who they're going to be. But if they're a sweet person and a kind person, then that's who they're going to be. Um, you know, that's what they've been stripped down to. So I, I definitely, all of the things that I learned were, they were easy to learn with him, it, it, just in the sense that, I don't mean anything about this was easy, but you know what I mean. It was easier because of, of who he was and because of his nature. And, and yes, I worked really hard to apply that to my mother, and it was much harder to apply it to her because she's the one who could push my buttons, and she's the one who I always had the conflicts with. Um, I think I, I resolved a lot by the time that she died, um, but she still frightened me. She still, I, I wrote about in this book that there was a curve in the road as I was going up to my parents' house where every time I hit that curve in the road, which was pretty close to my, to their house, my stomach would tense up um, because of her, because I knew I was going to be seeing her. I don't know why at that one point in the road, it was just like, that's when it would happen. And um, the day, the day that I got the news, I, I got the news Sunday morning that she had died. She died during the night and I was, so I, I obviously I got in the car and I was driving up to the house and I hit that one, <laughs> that one curve in the road and my stomach went in knots. And I said to myself out loud in the car, Patty, she's not there. Right. She's gone. She's not there. But you know, our bodies have a muscle memory. Our yes. emotions have a muscle memory. And yeah, there, sure. it was probably two weeks of driving up because we had to, you know, clear stuff out of the house and everything. It was probably a good two weeks before I could go past that, drive that route and get to that curve and not feel that. In, it, was, it was just, it was so fascinating to me. And I remember, you know, that day standing there over her body and there was a part of me that just, I sort of couldn't believe that she really wasn't here anymore. I really was waiting for her to like, sit up and tell me to cut my hair or something. <laughs> <laughs> She'd been talking to my mother. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, but you you did it and you had a different, you feel like, you must feel like you have a different relationship now with your father and your mother, even though they're both dead, because relationships still continue. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think I feel... Um, I feel much more resolved with, with both of them. Um, you know, certainly there's a sweetness about my relationship with my father that is very comforting to me. Mm -hmm. I would not use the word sweetness with my mother, but um, I definitely resolved a lot of things. And um, I think I did the best I could. I think I got, I, I evolved as much as I possibly could while she was still here. You know? I want to ask you about, there. the book is sprinkled with these wonderful quotes, which act as affirmations. I just, I loved them. And I thought this is part of why this book is so completely comforting because of those quotes. Did you always know you were going to have quotes or did you have a whole section of them before you started writing and you thought, you know what, these are comforting. I'm putting them in. Front. So I, I started keeping a quote book when I was in high school. Oh yeah. In high school. Wow. And, and it's evolved over the years, but some of those quotes, I think maybe some of them that were even in the book were ones that I found in, in high school. So I've always been really attracted to, to that. And, um, People, when I was running my support group, people would kind of tease me sometimes because I would always have a quote for something. You know, I would go, well, and there's this quote, for, you know. So when I started <laughs> writing this book, I thought, you know what? I'm going to put these in there. I'm going to I'm going to put them at the end of every chapter. Yeah, they were, they were completely wonderful. They were one of my favorite parts about the book because the book never gets, the book is about an overwhelming subject, but it never gets overwhelming. Oh. It always feels, I felt incredibly comforted reading the book. Thank you. Um, you have more questions, actually. First, Janet Clare, another wonderful writer, says, Patty, we met at the bar method 
in West LA and talk oh, wow. with your mothers. You look fabulous. Congratulations. Wow. And you have, a question, you have a question for Marjorie. Was and was something left out of the book during the publishing process, the editing process? Was there anything you wanted in there that was not? No. No, everything I wanted was in there. Yeah. Right. Great. So I want to show this gorgeous cover again, Floating in the Deep End. This is a book really for anybody with a parent or who knows somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's. This is this is for all of us, really, because we're all getting older and, you know, you never know what's coming down the pike. Um, and also, it's really, really a comforting book. It's really, really, really a comforting book. Um, I want to say we, we like to give bookshop.org as a place where you can order your book or you can go to your favorite independent bookstore. Also, Patty has written wonderful novels and wonderful other books and you should you know, go pick them up and go order them. Um, I want to thank you so much, Patty, for being here. Thank this you. is just, I hope the pandemic is over soon. So next time we come to New York, we can have coffee and we won't take any takeaways. <laughs> I want to thank everybody else for being here and for asking such great questions. Uh, floating in the Deep End. This um, is going to be on our YouTube station, the Mighty Blaze YouTube station. It will live there forever. So you can read it and read the comments and everything else. And thank you. I just want to check one more time. Oh, yes. I will have one more question for you. Sure. Um, you wrote in the book people who are dealing with people in dementia is you have to, you said, do you want to be right or do you want to be at peace? Which is another thing about letting things go. Can you just talk about that for your last question? Yeah, that's a line from The Course in Miracles. Oh, um, I didn't is, know that. Okay. That is a quote from The Course in Miracles. Do you want to be okay. right or do you want to be at peace? And I think it's a really important question that for us to ask ourselves in whatever situation, but particularly, you know, in something that's as difficult as, as dealing with a, um, a loved one with dementia. But here's the thing, I don't think there's any wrong answer. There are some times that, that your answer is, you know what, I wanna be right. I don't care about being at peace right now, I wanna be right. As long as you own where you're at. And I think yes. what happens, and I, cause I, you know, I definitely, I would ask myself that particularly with my mother. And there were times when I went, no, I want to be right. And, <laughs> but you do that enough, you own that enough times, you end up going, yeah, you, but you know what? It doesn't really feel that good. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, what's the point? You know, it doesn't really change anything. What's the point? So, so you kind of get out of that mindset of, nice. damn it, I'm going to be right. By allowing yourself to, to go there and owning that that's where you're coming from at that moment. Right, right. That's that's very astute. Well, thank you again, Patty. This was thank just you. It's a wonderful to see you, wonderful to talk to. And, th and just, you hang on. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody else. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll see you next time for Frontliner and other great interviews. And thank you for all your questions. We'll see you next time. Bye.